Thanks for downloading this episode from Teachers Talk Radio. You can find the full schedule and listen back to all our shows at ttradio.org. This show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, leading publishers of books, directories, educational guides and magazines aimed at schools in the UK and beyond. Enjoy the podcast. Welcome to the Friday Late Show with Daisy and Elizabeth. I'm Elizabeth Wells, a school archivist and specialist in the history of education. I'm here with Daisy Christodoulou, Director of Education at No More Marking, a provider of online writing assessments. We both feel that by thinking about education in the past, we can help make sense of it in the present and future. And that's what we're trying to do with this podcast. Our topic this episode is working class autodidacts, those who couldn't access formal education and so taught themselves instead. The figure of the autodidact has long captured imagination, from Thomas Hardy's Jude the Obscure, a stonemason who dreams of life as an academic, to Leela Chirulo, whose abilities render her the true brilliant friend of Elena Ferrante's Neapolitan Quartet novels. But what of the real-life autodidacts? So Daisy, what exactly do we mean when we talk about autodidacts? So the word autodidact literally means self-taught, so someone who teaches themselves. And I suppose if you want to be really pedantic, you can say to what extent does anyone actually teach themselves? To a certain extent, everyone is dependent on on some kind of institution or someone else in, in, in to some way. But I think when we talk about it in this in this British context, we're talking about it sort of probably the, the roots are in the 18th century, maybe late 18th century, the 19th century, and that era before the 1870 Education Act. So the 1870 Education Act does bring in compulsory education in England and Wales. It's quite a bit later than in, in, in Germany or Prussia. So everyone always compares England unfavourably with Germany on this count because Germany bring it in in, in more, um, sort of the 18th century. The, the true autodidact is probably the kind of working class, those working class people who want to get themselves an education, don't necessarily have access to the very formal institutions that are providing an education and so take a huge responsibility themselves to to educate themselves. And as a result of that, you do then actually get some institutions popping up, some working class institutions. So you get these really interesting mutual improvement societies where working class people will meet themselves, maybe in like a, a room over a pub, uh, they'll pay a small subscription fee and they'll, they'll just talk about uh, topics that interest them. People might present papers and then you'll have some slightly more formal ones that are funded, perhaps more funded by 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 the middle class or by the state or by religious organisations. But I think the essential idea behind the autodidact is someone, as I say, who's really taking this responsibility for their own learning, not having enormous amounts of help necessarily from the outside world, but are almost yeah, driven by this ethic of kind of self-improvement and self-betterment and, and really wanting to know more um, and, and to have this uh, intellectual curiosity. So that's that's the kind of the, the, the era we're going to look at today. That's the sort of milieu that these people are, are, are working in. And it, it's a really fascinating one. And I think also quite inspiring. Now, you started off mentioning Jude the Obscure. I don't want to give away any secrets here, but things don't end well for Jude in Jude the Obscure. <laughs> but the really nice thing about a lot of the stories here is they're really quite inspirational stories that do end quite well, both for the individuals and, as we'll see, really for, for wider society. Can you tell us about some of these autodidacts? Yeah, definitely. So first of all, for this this first part, the, the book that's really great on this and the book that I'm going to draw some of these anecdotes from, it's a fantastic book called, uh, it's by Jonathan Rose, and it's called The Intellectual Lives of the British Working Classes. And he really just does this huge survey of, yeah, the intellectual lives of the British working classes in this period. It's often quite a hard thing to research. A lot of the, the, the people who live there, they don't necessarily leave a lot of records behind. These are often still quite poor people. Um, not necessarily of interest to researchers at the time, but he does this great kind of digging through the archives, read lots of auto- reads lots of autobiographies to try and work out what are people reading, what are people thinking, what are ordinary people uh, kind of interested in learning about. And he pulls together some some really fantastic and quite moving stories about people. And one other thing I want to say, I think when we think about this is uh, probably the early Victorian period we're looking at here when we look at this period often I think we we think of the Victorians when we think about self-improvement in the Victorian era we often think of it as being something that's either a a, quite a sort of um maybe slightly puritanical moralistic self-improvement or we think of it perhaps as being uh, class related so when people say they want to better themselves and that that's thought of in a a class-based sense or we think of it maybe in terms of money 
that people want to improve, you know, want, want to want to improve their financial position. And I think we all nowadays maybe look on those three things that, that, that in class, you know, improving your class status, improving your financial status, improving, uh, you know, improving morally. We, we may nowadays look at them. We look, we look down on those things a little bit and, and look back at the Victorians as being, as I say, a little bit puritanical and hypocritical. But I think what is fascinating about the Jonathan Rose book is he is looking at self-improvement in terms of genuine intellectual self-improvement of people who are intellectually curious and kind of just want to learn more and just want to know more. And there isn't, in a lot of cases, this huge financial motivation. It isn't a motivation that, like, well, this is going to help me get on in my career. And there are all these fascinating anecdotes about kind of Welsh miners who are basically saying, I've got to spend six, eight, ten hours a day in kind of horrible darkness and cramped positions. And they're always coming out of it and saying, I, I quite like some sweetness and light in the rest of my life. And, and I've used that phrase, there, sweetness and light, from Matthew Arnold, because people, Matthew Arnold said, we should be teaching people, we should be teaching students, and we should give them this induction into all that's best, that's known and fault, and induct them into sweetness and light. And people often look at Matthew Arnold as this middle class guy who's, who's looking down maybe on working class people. But what is really interesting in this book, working class men and women really want this, that it's not something that's being imposed on them. Actually, in some ways, knowing about culture and knowing about books and knowing about music is being denied to them, and they are trying to seize it for themselves. That is the really fascinating thing about this era. So let's have a couple of anecdotes. I've, I've put the context of that. So the first one, I've picked someone um, who, who grew up near, near, near where I grew up. Um, this is Will Crooks. He grew up in East London. And he's got this, this great... He, he ends up in later life becoming the f- only the fourth Labour MP. So he grows up in poverty, sort of uh, a time of... Uh, there's recessions. His, 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 his family can't get jobs. He, he struggles with, with, with employment. And he remembers being a young boy and he spends two pence buying a copy of a second-hand translation of the Iliad. And he reads it, and he says he was dazzled. And he says, what a revelation it was to me. Pictures of romance and beauty I had never dreamed of suddenly opened up before my eyes. I was transported from the East End to an enchanted land. It was a rare luxury for a working lad like me, just home from work, to find myself suddenly among the heroes and nymphs of ancient Greece. And Rose's book is full of anecdotes like that. And, and and it kind of reminds you, I guess, of that line from Keats's poem on first looking into Chapman's Homer, where he talks about just how dazzled he is by all of these stories, that this is how a lot of these these people felt when they first read read literature. So, and, and, you know, some of the, 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 the some of the, some of the oldest literature in the case of the, the Iliad, that it was just eye opening and dazzling for them. That's one great story from 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 Will Crooks. Some of the most fascinating stories are from Lancashire, where there's lots of weavers in Lancashire, and weavers could read at their looms. And lots of them did read at their looms, <laughs> and they read enormous amounts. <laughs> and there's uh, one, one guy, another, another guy who goes on to be a Labour MP, George Tomlinson. He goes on to be a Minister of Education in Atlee's Cabinet, post-45. And he recalls, he would sit his loom and he recalls reading Shakespeare, he recalls reading Hamlet, um, you know, sitting there while he was, he was, he was working. And as I say, I alluded to the, the Welsh miners earlier. There's a huge tradition of miners' libraries. and Some of them get some element of state support. Some of them are supported by subscriptions from the miners. One of the, the, the great stories in this, um, in this Jonathan Rose book is he talks about a boy called Joseph Keating. Um, and he is a, a collier. And he, he's a collier who has one of the worst jobs, the toughest and worst paid jobs in the mine, which is uh, basically shoveling out tons of refuse for half a crown a day. So that's his job. But he, in the miners' libraries, he stumbles across Greek philosophy uh, and he stays up reading until until 3am. Uh, and it's not just him that he ends up, he actually overhears things that his fellow his fellow miners are talking about. And some of those are talking about uh, some of this literature as well. And one of them, he overhears quoting Alexander Pope uh, and his, 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 his colleague, his, his workmate says to him, me and Pope do agree very well. <laughs> so there is this huge tradition of reading uh, some of this literature and... Yeah, just the, this feeling of people really wanting to, to access this knowledge, really wanting to read great literature. And as I say, wanting to do it, not out of a sense that it's something that's going to help them get on in their career or get them a better job, but just that it's something that is just lovely to know. I think that's really inspirational, the idea of learning as an end to itself and, and, and something that we've really begun to move away from in our, our modern society. There is this constant focus on the utility of education for upward social mobility, for capitalist development in our society, productivity and the like, um, rather than seeing these things really as just an end to themselves. 
I think one of the other things that's really nice about those stories that you've told are, are they're from the perspective of the people um, learning themselves. Um, a lot of the stories that I'd come across about um, autodidacts from a little bit earlier, sort of in the 18th century, are very much focused on these benevolent aristocrats who encounter brilliant individuals and are w wonderful benefactors to them and help them um, access formal education. Um, I came across recently the story of the, the 18th century Scottish mathematician Edmund Stone, who was the son of the gardener to the Duke of Argyll. And one day the Duke of Argyll, he's wandering around his beautifully manicured <laughs> lawns, and he sees this copy of Isaac Newton's great work, Principia, lying on the grass, and thinking that it's somehow become misplaced from his own library, he goes to pick it up, when uh, a, a young man uh, comes and explains that the book's his own, it's his own copy of Principia. And the Duke questions this, this teenager um, and realises that he's got quite a sophisticated understanding of the very complicated mathematics um, expressed by, by Newton. And he asks him, you know, how on earth has he, he come to become so proficient? And this young man, the son of, of the gardener, replies, does one need to know anything more than the 24 letters in order to learn everything else that one wishes? And the 18th and 19th centuries, they're full of these stories of, of aristocrats yeah. who happen across yeah. labourers who, yeah. Yeah. having learned to read, have been able to, to teach themselves, um, at least until this, this generous benefactor steps in and, and helps them and, and, you know, provides them with, um, you know, access to mm. formal education, sends them to a school or, or to a university. But for me, I think what really leaps out from those stories is just the value of access to cheap books or to libraries to enable that culture of, of self-education. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a huge, huge theme throughout this era. Uh, that's a fascinating quotation there. You know, do, do you need anything more than the, the 24 to 24 letters then to, to be able to, 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 to know everything? And, and that is a huge theme, the theme of literacy and the huge increase in literacy rates in this era and what is fascinating is this that happens, this happens before 1870. So literacy rates in England and Wales are increasing rapidly before the introduction of compulsory schooling. So again, it's happening because of, I think, just changes in the culture, this ethic of, of self-improvement. There are, as I say, some institutions, there's the religious schools, there's voluntary schools, there's, there's, there's the self-improvement societies there's, there's lots of sort of uh, working men's institutions so literacy is increasing even before you get to compulsory education and then once people are literate they want something to read and so then you've got the thing of all well, the public libraries um, the miners libraries ways of sort of sharing and, and um, you know, share, sharing books uh, amongst groups of people and even cheap books that can be sold so Jonathan Rose in his book has a whole section on the kind of books that are cheap at this time and the kinds that are more expensive. One of the arguments he makes is that the, the working class, the, these, these working class people often have quite conservative cultural tastes. And actually one of the reasons is older books are cheaper. Uh, so the books written by older authors are often easier to pick up, as Will Crooks did, picking up a copy of the Iliad for, for, for two, 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 two pence. But actually some of the newer books are more expensive and, and actually are harder to access. So... Absolutely. Once people are literate and once you've got some cheaper reading material out there that's available, um, it, it just it gives, it gives people access to, to all these kind of ideas and books and thoughts and, and opens up their minds in new ways. How does gender play into this? Is literacy increasing amongst women as well? Are they finding the time to sit down and read the Iliad or are they having a hard day in the factory and then coming back and cooking dinner for the children and <coughs> cleaning the house? Yeah, so it's a really good point, and it is true that I think a lot of these institutions are, they're quite male-dominated. A lot of them are sort of spring out of working men's institutes or industries that are very dominated by male labour. But I would still say that this is a part of the wider culture too, and women are part of that wider culture. The literacy rates are increasing amongst women as well. I would say perhaps the most famous example of, of a woman in who, who 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 kind of benefits, if you like, not necessarily from these institutions we're talking about, from from this idea and this ethic of, of self improvement, is a woman called uh, Catherine McMullen. Now, a little bit later than some of the other people we've been looking at, she's born in 1906. 
she's born into um, a, a very poor family. She's the daughter of a, a washerwoman, a washerwoman who spent time in, in kind of the workhouses from the, the northeast. She has a you know incredibly sort of poor and, and difficult upbringing. She's actually illegitimate, and so the she's you know, you know all of the kind of stigma that attaches to that. You know, she, she's working herself uh, as a workhouse laundress. She's working in service, but she really she aspires to be a writer. She reads lots of, of magazines. She reads lots of books. She aspires to something more. And the the most interesting part of this story is that the, the book she ends up reading, a lot of her later success, is The Letters of Lord Chesterfield to His Son. And the, the really odd thing about this is The Letters of Lord Chesterfield to His Son letters written by a very aristocratic quite snobbish you know man who who is giving this private advice to his son that he never means to be published and it's being read by this daughter you know, this illegitimate daughter of a washerwoman in the northeast and she's finding it hugely inspirational <laughs> and she says with lord chesterfield i read my first mythology i learned my first real history and geography i went with lord chesterfield i went traveling the world i would fall asleep reading the letters and awake around three o'clock in the morning my mind deep in the fascination of this new world so she's hugely inspired by this it's interesting because it's a very didactic text you know he is setting out to educate his son Mm -hmm. and setting out a really clear Mm -hmm. pathway for his son to learn um and, and become a gentleman absolutely i think the other really interesting thing about this and the thing about the interesting thing about I guess literature in general is you never know how a reader is going to pick it up and take it, and you, the, the the enormously long shelf life of some of these books. Again, Will Crooks in nineteenth century poplar picking up the Iliad. It's it, that is in itself is, is 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 astonishing, especially when you think of popular culture now and the way that things have a shelf life of you know a couple of months. <laughs> um, and again, the idea that these letters that were never meant to be published have turned into something that's, uh, you, you know, inspiring people in a completely different context, completely different culture. It is remarkable. And then, you know, just to finish this, this this inspires Catherine McMullen into a, a whole course of reading, if you like, of the, the sort of greats of Western civilization. And the, where's the punchline coming here? You know, who is Catherine McMullen? What does she turn into? Well, her, the name that she's better known by now is Catherine Cookson. So she writes these incredibly famous, I guess, romantic novels that... Um, I guess Lizzie if you're our age they were always they were televised and they were always kind of seemed to be on on weeknights on ITV and then the mid 90s and I'll be honest I am not a a, a huge kind of massive Catherine Cookson fan (laughs) when they were on when I was a kid I used to sort of get quite bored I don't ever watch one from start to finish but they're wildly successful books for years they were the most popular books in in, in county libraries weren't they 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 were the most borrowed Absolutely. And I remember that too. I'd go to, to my local library and wanted to, you know, get out the Agatha Christie's and there were so many Cookson's on the same shelf, the Christie's and Cookson's. They were the, the, the ones. So an incredibly popular author. I think her popularity has waned a bit in the last sort of 20 years. Who knows how much it will endure. But an unbelievable story. And again, she's a little bit younger than some of the people we're talking about here than that real heyday of the working class sort of didacticism. But she very much, I would say, comes out of that culture. And it's, 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 it's an incredible story. And again, I think, as with all of these, quite inspiring stories. These have all been really amazing people to learn about. But I know you've been holding back. I know you've got a, a couple more that you've been, been saving up. So let's just cut to a break now. And then when we come back, you can tell me about the, the two most impressive autodidacts you've come across. This show is brought to you in partnership with John Katz Educational, a leading publisher of books, directories, educational guides and magazines specifically aimed at forward-thinking schools in the UK and beyond. Have you checked out their latest releases? Don't miss out. Visit johncatbookshop.com to explore their full range of titles and advance your own professional development today. Happy reading. Okay, Daisy, who have you got for us? In this first half, the first half that just gone, we were looking at, I guess, some more ordinary people, just ordinary people who wanted to learn more. And then we looked at Catherine Cookson, who then went on to be rather extraordinary in terms of her publication uh, history. But the two people I want to look at now are two people I think are, are, are kind of have world historical importance almost. <laughs> so they come out of this of, of, of this culture of self mutual self improvement, working class or didactism, and they make discoveries which we are quite literally all completely dependent on today. And they are two men, the two men, um, Michael Faraday and George George Bull. And I'm going to hope I pronounce that correctly. 
I'm going to spell it just so you get an idea of it in your head. It's B O O L E. So Michael Faraday and George Ball. So let's look at both of them. So Michael Faraday, I am a huge Faraday fan. Um, and a couple of reasons for that. When I was growing up, he was on the £20 note. So he was on the £20 note in the 1990s. And obviously he makes all these kind of discoveries to do with electricity. And when I was growing up, my dad was an electrician. So my dad would always point him out on the £20 note. You know, this guy's like the father of electricity. Um, so I was always kind of impressed by him. When you learn more about him, he's even more impressive. He's born in South London. I now live in South London. And so Faraday, yeah, I think he's a, he's a, he's a great South Londoner. But actually, to be fair, he doesn't live in South London very long. He He's born in in what, what's now kind of Kennington, um, St Mary's Newington, that parish. He does move when he's about four or five. But really interesting little factoid about Faraday. He is born in this parish of St Mary's Newington, um, which is near, 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 near modern day sort of Kennington. Uh, just kind of s- off the Elephant and Castle roundabout. He's born there in September 1791. And just a couple of months later, in the same parish, another really important pioneering scientist is born, Charles Babbage. So Charles Babbage is really influential in terms of the early development of the computer, develops the analytic engine. Charles Babbage is actually from a more, more privileged family than Faraday. Uh, it's kind of a bit like nowadays, I guess, that you have... Lots of different social classes all living cheek by jowl in London. That's the, the true then. So Babbage is from a more a more privileged family, but is born in the same parish as Faraday two months later. And I always think with Charles Babbage, you invent the computer and you're not even the most successful, most famous, most significant scientist born in your parish in that year. <laughs> right? Because Faraday is even more important, important and even more kind of fundamental than inventing book the computer because he kind of just does all this stuff with electricity it's incredibly profound he's a really big deal albert einstein kept a picture of faraday on his study wall he's got a tremendous number of inventions and breakthroughs and things named after him you know you look at the list of it if you look at it on on wikipedia um and 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 hugely hugely kind of respected by his peers but what is remarkable about him is he has so little formal schooling so little formal education so he has this really quite basic primary education where it really very much is just reading writing and arithmetic a couple of years of that he's apprenticed at the age of 14 to a bookbinder and because he's apprenticed to a bookbinder again it comes back to the point you made earlier lizzie that you have access to reading material so he can read and he's got access to an enormous amount of reading material and he will sometimes say if there's a book that's sent into the bookbinder that he really likes the look of he'll ask if he can keep it and copy it before giving it back and a lot of his uh, the customers they're, they're okay with that so he even starts to sort of build up a little library of himself. One of the books that really influenced him is a real key text in this era. It's a, 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 um, it's a, a Methodist, a, not, a, a dissenting minister, Isaac Watts, who I think nowadays we'd know better for his hymns. He wrote a lot of hymns. But he also wrote a, a, a kind of early self-improvement text. And it's a mix. It's a real mix of sort of productivity advice <laughs> and also how to think scientifically <laughs> and it's a, it's a really interesting book and it influences a lot of people and Faraday is very influenced by that both in terms of what it means for making the most of his time and in terms of how to think scientifically and how to think about scientific problems and he goes along to lots of meetings of the City Philosophical Society he goes along to lectures by Humphrey Davy this is where he gets his kind of big break he goes along to all these lectures by Humphrey Davy and he makes incredibly beautiful notes he writes them all out, his notes and the implications of it, and then he binds them up because he's a bookbinder, and he sends them off to Davy, and Davy sees him and is like, right, do you want to be my assistant? And that's where it kind of takes off for him. Um, and he then is at the Royal Institution. He becomes very famous for giving the great Royal Institution lectures. That's what's on actually the old twenty pound note, a picture of him lecturing about a can- candle and what, what that means. And it becomes one of the most the most famous scientists of his day. He makes all these um, in- incredible incredible breakthroughs. And But as I say, it starts out from these very, very humble beginnings. And I think there's also a point to be made here about what does this mean? That What does this mean in terms of... You, can you make an argument that he was helped by his lack of education? I think that's definitely something that I was going to ask. Yeah. Do, you, do you think some of these people really flourish outside of formal education because they've avoided a kind of potential straitjacket to their thinking? I think they're... There's a, perhaps a romantic notion, I don't know how much it's borne out, that a lot of these autodidacts, they're sort of mavericks, they're inventors, they're outsiders who come in with a different perspective. So I think this is a really 
key point and a really interesting one to discuss. And I think it's difficult and I don't want to overclaim and I don't want to go too far here, but it's certainly something worth thinking about. There is an argument, and, and again, I'm not a scientist um, and, you, you know, I don't want to go into too much detail about, you, you know, particularly scientific findings, but there are some facts that are of particular interest. So that there are people who say that it is significant that Faraday did not go to Cambridge. So most professional scientists at this time, most, most scientists at this time would have been to Cambridge and Faraday didn't go. And there is an argument that it was significant that he didn't go and it was probably a good thing he didn't go because he ends up coming up with some things that kind of think outside the, the box that perhaps someone who had gone to Cambridge, they would just not have been thinking in that way. The second interesting thing is that he has this, as I say, quite basic primary education, pretty elementary arithmetic. He doesn't have great mathematical skills. <laughs> it's remarkable. He's a great experimentalist. Davy develops into an experimentalist. There are all these hugely entertaining stories in their early days where uh, they, they just seem to go around kind of blowing things up. Um, and Davy's constantly getting his sort of blinded by glass in his eyes because they're blowing up test tubes and Faraday has to go around and sort of tidy everything up. So there are all these sort of uh, interesting stories in their early days. Uh, Faraday, as I say, a, a tremendous experimentalist, that's what everybody kind of says about him, but doesn't have kind of brilliant maths, which feels really weird. And it's an, a later person, it's James Clark Maxwell, who's um, sort of younger than him. They, they, they do meet, but, but Maxwell is quite a bit younger, who ends up turning a lot of... Faraday's findings into a set of equations that kind of form the basis of sort of modern electri- electrical engineering. That I find remarkable too, that, that Faraday is able to do all this without these advanced mathematical skills um, and has the enormous respect and admiration of people like James Clark Maxwell and Einstein who, who are working with the maths that flows from that flow from that. You can make the argument with Faraday, is he an argument for or against universal education? <laughs> you can make the argument for it in the oh, wow aren't there or imagine all the neglected Faraday's out there he's lucky he gets his he's lucky he lives in London I mean if he's not in London it's quite hard to see him getting that break and so how many other Faraday's are there not in London who don't get that break and we should have universal education to scoop them up into the educational system so you can make that argument but people have made the other argument that perhaps there was a way in which not being in universal education did that allow him to to flourish more as I say I don't want to overclaim here I think this is this is all very interesting I think the the wider point I would make is the way that even in the absence of a universal education system and pathways for people like Faraday to get to places like Cambridge, there were still all of these institutions. And as I say, not just institutions, but the culture, the sense of of self-improvement that allowed um, people like Faraday to exist and to succeed. So that for me is the more is is, is that the wider point to take out of it. But it, but the whole Cambridge point is certainly interesting. Who's next, George Boole? Are we going with Boole? I, th- I think we're going with that. So <laughs> so yeah. So so Boole is a, a little bit uh, younger than, than Faraday, but again, I think solidly in this era that we're talking about. He's born in eighteen fifteen, and he's born in Lincoln. So he kind of I guess doesn't have that advantage of Faraday of being close to some of these big London institutions. He's also very interesting in that his father is, is, is quite an important figure in his life. His father is clearly quite a talented... His father is a shoemaker. So his father is not from a wealthy background. His father does not um, kind of have lots of advantages. His father is a shoemaker who essentially really sort of neglects his trade a bit because he loves, he loves maths. And he also loves tinkering and inventing. So he loves all of these things, but he neglects his, his, his trade he ends up spending a bit of time in prison for, 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 for unpaid debts. So George Ball, in that sense, has quite a difficult upbringing, certainly quite poor. But in another sense, his father teaches him maths. So again, how, how much, you know, this auto died, I think, how true is it? George Ball does not have a, a, a great formal education. Again, it's a bit like Faraday, really, a couple of years of sort of um, your, your basic primary and then a, apprenticeship at 14. Or, you know, you know, I think he goes off to, he ends up at 16, I think, becoming a teacher but he does have some education in mathematics from his father. He's part of the kind of the Lincoln, I think the Mechanics Institute, the Working Men's Institute there. And he is very highly regarded there from a young age. It's obvious that he is astoundingly, astoundingly brilliant. He teaches himself all kinds of things. I think there's a story about how he, in the local paper, he has uh, a Latin verse published. And he's accused of plagiarism because they don't believe that anyone could write Latin verse like that at his age. All of the other people in these institutes realise he is clearly something special. <laughs> so I think he's loaned a calculus textbook. He doesn't have a tutor. So this, you come back to the thing of, is it good or bad that he didn't have this formal education? Well, it takes him such a long time to learn calculus. He has the textbook, 
but he doesn't have a tutor. And this is an interesting point to go back to your point of, you know, once you can read, you can do everything. It's, it's hard, though. <laughs> it's hard. I mean, yes, he has a calculus textbook, but to work through that on your own without guidance is it's tremendously difficult. And I think this is why teachers do matter. It is great to have uh, booked and it is great to be an also didact, but you have a teacher and they can they can help you and they can help you at the points that you you struggle with. Do you think there are some things that are just inherently easier for people to teach oneself or that some people perhaps have a natural gift? A, a lot of these autodidacts we hear have these very sort of mathematical brains. And at some point I feel like the the discourse around autodidacts kind of tips over into talk about genius too and people who just have this sort of natural gifted ability in a particular um in a particular field so i think partly when you read the lives of faraday and ball you do just kind of think my god they are geniuses this is crazy there there has to be something about just talent and people being born that way because it is remarkable what they achieve but the flip side of it and actually the argument i'm almost trying to make here is that they are a part as much as they are autodidacts they are in a culture that whilst it doesn't provide necessarily lots of money and lots of formal institutions they are in, they are kind of soaked in a culture that does care about this stuff mm. and that's what i find so important and that's where i'd say i, I don't want to get get into you know the past present past was always better or whatever but you alluded to it earlier is there a sense now in which we view education in much more almost utilitarian and financial terms whereas i think faraday and ball are growing up in an era where both the working classes perhaps and the middle classes and everyone they are interested in education because they want to learn more and they want to know more and so i, I think you you cannot they are very impressive individuals but they are also part of a culture and they are part of uh, that culture forms them absolutely it forms them that culture i would argue it's not solely responsible for all their achievements, but that culture does give rise to some of their, their, their achievements. Um, and so let's just go on and finish the, the George Ball story. Like, why am I raving about him? What does he go on to do? So here's the other interesting thing. Faraday is incredibly famous in his lifetime and everyone in his lifetime is like, wow, this is quite impressive. George Ball, less so. He does achieve some degree of, 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 of renown. So he ends up, incredibly, as a professor of mathematics at the University of Cork in Ireland. So he moves to Ireland does all kinds of interesting research, publishes all kinds of interesting papers, is well known in his own lifetime as someone who has, you know, made these very interesting breakthroughs, but almost doesn't really become, I guess, really seen as the pioneer he is until much later because a lot of his work, his work is on symbolic logic. It ends up being named after him, Boolean logic. And the logic he develops underpins a lot of the modern, the modern information age. So it's responsible for a lot of the development of early computers and it's also responsible, I think, for a lot of the the the, the, the theory underpinning things like Google and Google searches and, and things like that. And in fact, Google have done quite a few Google doodles and a few a few things around him because he is so, so influential and so important in, in this area. So I said Faraday, every time you put a light switch on, you can think of Faraday. Every time you're doing a Google search or you fire up your computer, uh, you know, that's that's Faraday and Ball. <laughs> that's, that's kind of over them. So obviously there's lots of other scientists who matter. I'm not saying it's just them. But his logic is is tremendously important in, in the development of, of, of this. So again, a remarkable story that someone who is born into quite a lot of poverty, into not into, um, you know, a real big city like Faraday, into... Um, you know, a, a smaller town that is away away from the the, the kind of the big centres of, of of intellectual life in in London, and makes these in, incredible breakthroughs that are still enormously influential today. There is a slightly unhappy ending with him. So I think the thing about Faraday and Bull, they both, as far as we know, seem to have been good guys. It's hard to say that now. I feel like someone will come along and find out something. You know, Faraday he was. Uh... <laughs> well, the, the thing about Faraday, he seems to have been a good guy. Seems to have lots of nice things he did in life. The one thing with Faraday where I think he's at risk of getting cancelled is he was Margaret Thatcher's favourite scientist. And no, <laughs> nobody wants to be Margaret Thatcher's favourite scientist, right? So um, that's that's Faraday's uh, kind of afterlife. I think that, that Ball... So Faraday, I think, as far as we can see, does you know, tend to sort of get on with people, have friends, seems to be you know this, this, this nice guy people speak very well of. I think with Ball, lots of... Again, generally seems lots of, lots of nice things as well, but the, the slightly unhappy ending with him 
is he he dies he gets a cold after being soaked in a storm and his wife when he comes back from being soaked in the storm his wife wraps him on wet in wet blankets on the grounds that like cures like so she misapplies his own logic possibly we could look at it like that <laughs> yeah and and this is something we can maybe have a little look at a bit later of um you know if we're going to say about any 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 downsides of of, of autodidactism or whatever but that is not a not a not a great ending he dies sort of younger than 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 perhaps he, he might have otherwise um but another interesting thing he has i think five daughters and i think all five daughters go on to do some quite remarkable things um, for, for women in their era one of them writes a, a book that's an enormously best-selling book in the in the 19th century so a couple of them I think go on to be professors themselves have very very interesting careers intellectual careers themselves so clearly clearly a fascinating man a absolutely fascinating man who yeah achieved achieved sort of so much um and, and a fascinating life story and I would say actually the the, the there's there's a lot written about Faraday because, as I say, Faraday was just really famous in his day, and so lots of people about Faraday. But George Ball, there wasn't always a lot written about him at the time. He wasn't as famous, and it's only now, as I say, Google have maybe got involved. And one of Ball's uh, Ball's current current kind of successor as uni- as professor of mathematics at the University of Cork, he's written a really interesting couple of books about him, and he has also a slightly wacky theory that I think maybe has some truth to it that maybe George Ball was the model for Professor Moriarty in the Sherlock Holmes books. And that's not because he was evil or nasty, (laughs) but because he was just this total genius <laughs> who had these quite abstract brilliant ideas. <laughs> and that and that perhaps home um Conan Doyle uses him as a model. So Ball's modern biographer has this theory and he pulls together a, a fair bit of evidence, which I wouldn't say is conclusive, but is certainly intriguing. And he does superimpose a, a, a drawing of Moriarty by Sidney Paget on top of uh, a drawing or a photograph of Ball and I tell you what the, the resemblance is uncanny I will give him that that's great <laughs> let's go to a break now and when we get back I think we need to think about what our debt is to autodidactism this show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational a leading publisher of books directories educational guides and magazines specifically aimed at forward-thinking schools in the UK and beyond. Have you checked out their latest releases? Don't miss out. Visit johncatbookshop.com to explore their full range of titles and advance your own professional development today. Happy reading. At the very start, Lizzie, you mentioned Jude the Obscure. Doesn't end well for Jude. Most of the people I've looked at here, it probably ends a bit better. I mean, it's not great for George Ball that he ends up with this you know getting wrapped in blankets and and dying as he does but still you know achieves so much and, and and does so much so actually i think if our image of autodidacts at the start was with Jude the obscure i hope that what we've seen so far is actually perhaps for a lot of these these people it ends a bit better and it works out better for them but i do want to i would say if i had if we'd been doing this podcast maybe five or ten years ago i would have probably finished here and said isn't this great this is so empowering, it's so inspiring, these stories of ordinary people through determination and curiosity, making their own lives better, making society's lives better. Isn't this an amazing and inspiring story? And I would have finished it there. And I still think there is a lot of truth to that. But the more I've thought about it, and I think also the more that things maybe have happened in the outside world, is maybe I've also started to think, are there some dark sides of autodidacticism? I think you definitely get that thread coming through with the story of Jude the Obscure because although it's all very well for us to sit and praise uh, working class people who who learn for learning's sake, there is an incredible frustration there for people who do want um, upward social mobility and they do want access through self-education to the established world, to the elite and find themselves denied. There's a really poignant bit in Jude the Obscure when his... uh, cousin and and lover Sue Bridehead says to him you are one of the very men that Christminster and by Christminster it's really a cipher for Oxford was intended for when the colleges were founded a man with passion for learning but no money or opportunities or friends but you were elbowed off the pavement by the millionaire's sons and I think it loops back to the the conversation we were having last time about about public schools and the intent of some of these um, formal educational institutions to provide for the poorer people in society. 
effectively being squeezed out by this by this point by we get it by the time we get into the 18th and the 19th century I think that's very true and, and, and very much uh, loops back to what we were saying last week. So you have all these institutions, uh, educational institutions that are set up for people like Jude, Faraday, George Ball, George Ball's father. So we're talking about the things ending well. Actually, probably the saddest story in all of this I've talked about, we haven't dwelt on him that much, is George Ball's father. He is this inventor. He, he loves mathematics. He, he really wants to learn. And he doesn't have that opportunity and he ends up in debtor's prison and things don't go so well with him. Um, And so, yes, you're right. It's easy to focus on the successes, on the people who do um, uh, improve their lives in this way. But let's not forget that the downside of this, which is people who had this enormous thirst for knowledge, that they were never really adequately able to fulfil. And that's that that is sad. And there's, there's a lot of that there, too. So it's important not to forget that. But actually, in terms of the the kind of dark side of autodidacticism. What I want to talk about now, and this may be a little bit controversial, but is there a point at which autodidacticism shades into antinomianism? So what do I mean by antinomianism? I was going to ask you that, <laughs> Lucy. It's quite a word. Yes. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's basically it's a religious word. It's, it's, uh, that's its origin. So it's, it, it, the Greek meaning is literally against the law, anti antinomos. Um, and it's... It, it, it's Generally, its origins, it's a religious term that basically people in the established church or whatever are using to have a go at sectarians, if you like. And they're saying, you are uh, you are against the law, you're kind of against the Ten Commandments, you just think you can make up all the rules as you go along, uh, you don't understand, you, you need to have rules, you, you need to follow the Ten Commandments. And they're kind of using that and throwing all that kind of abuse at... Uh, some of these different, you know, smaller religious groups that kind of spring up in the, in the 17th century. So it's, origins are as a, a religious term, but I think it's now taken on a secular meaning. Uh, and, and, and Orwell actually in his works, I think, uses it quite a bit. And, and the secular meaning of it would be someone who is just, I guess, doesn't think thinks the rules don't apply to them. Mm-hmm. So these yeah. mavericks, disruptors. Right. If anybody's been to see Glass Onion recently, yep. Uh, yep. you know, the, the kind of Elon Musks of this yeah. world, maybe? Yeah. So, and I think, yeah, Elon Musk is maybe a good a good example there because he would be someone who probably divides opinion. <laughs> and to what extent is thinking you're outside the law? In some way, you can say, well, you're a great disruptor and you look at all these established institutions and you see them as something to disrupt and come up with something better. To what extent is it someone who looks at the established institutions and destroys them and then everything ends up being a lot worse? <laughs> um, and I also think that, that what about this this phrase that I think has become quite common in the last few years of people, who, you know, people who say, well, I did my own research. Now, that's actually a classic autodidact line. That's what autodidacts are doing. They're doing their own research. But I think we've seen that probably being used in a slightly more problematic way in the last few years. Mm-hmm. So... In some ways, you've got these really inspiring stories of autodidacts who make their own lives better and then make these great scientific breakthroughs that improve all our lives, and there's no downside to that. But in some ways, does this idea that you can make it on your own, you can do your own research, you can educate yourself, and you know, does that sometimes mean you stray out of these established tram lines in a way that is not good? So these things are not easy. Another thing I'd throw in the, into the mix here is this phrase, knowledge is power. I love that line. It's influenced me a lot in my own career. Um, It's something that I think a lot of these, all the people we've talked about would absolutely agree with, that the more you know, the more power you have. And that's one of the great things about education, that it gives people knowledge, it gives them power, the more you understand about the world. But I think even that is something what I feel less certain about than I did five or ten years ago. You'd rather be a happy idiot than a miserable (laughs) genius. It's not, no, it's not that actually. It it isn't that. Because I think a lot of the people in this book who, a lot of the the people I've talked about, they do end up happy. So knowing stuff does make them happier. (laughs) No, it's it's more than that. It's that there's a lot of interesting research coming out now that the more you know about a topic, actually the more polarisation there is. So they've done these really interesting surveys on climate change where they show that climate change deniers and climate change believers, if you like, they both have very high levels of scientific knowledge. And you think, well, how, how can that be that people who have high scientific levels of knowledge are disagreeing that much? And there's this kind of sort of growing idea, growing theory that the, the more people know about something, the more actually it just ends up reinforcing their prejudices and they take that knowledge to reinforce what they thought already. So this idea, that I, I was, you know, when we when these people first started talking about fake news and, and, and um, 
you know, what do we do about misinformation? My initial response was always, well, you know, education, knowledge is power and we need to educate and we have the truth. And actually, when you look at some of this research, you start to think, hmm, really? And then you look at perhaps some conspiracy theories too. So I, I watched a really good Netflix documentary the other day where there was a guy there who had done his own research on the, um, the Earth being flat. And he was a bit of an autodidact. He'd really gone off and educated himself. Mm. He'd educated himself that I think most of us, most people in the world are going to say he's, he's gone down the wrong, wrong route here. But he had libraries. He's got books on his shelves and he reads them all and he's got arguments and he's got models. And what is really interesting is that, you know, he's, he's constructed all these arguments. He's used knowledge to construct all these arguments. And so you look at something like that and you think, is knowledge power? Now, I still think it is, but I just think it's more complicated than I would have said five or ten years ago. And I still think autodidacticism and that culture and that spirit is really good. But it is maybe a little bit more complicated. I'm going to trigger you by saying, do, do you need skills to temper that? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think that I haven't changed my mind at all on my belief that um, skills are just collections of a really well remembered and well organized knowledge so i definitely haven't <laughs> changed my mind on that i think we do have to yeah, there is a wider point that probably can't be solved by education alone which is about it's probably more to do with what we think the, the the right place for authority and independent thought and the balance between those and that they are in a complex relationship <laughs> and getting the balance between them right is not straightforward you can obviously see things go wrong if you uh, kind of have too much authority and too much pressing down and saying things must be thought about in a certain way, that that does restrict um, individual thought and freedom and innovation. But I think we've also seen in the last few years that it's possible also perhaps to go too far the other way and that completely untrammeled independent thought does not always, doesn't always lead to a Faraday, if only it would. And, and, and just on that wider point of why I think some of these things are not just to do with culture, but are not just to do with education, but with the wider culture, and so that, that, there's a, a really interesting theory that from um, someone from this autodidactic background, a really interesting um, anarchist thinker. We've been talking about antinomians. This is a, a, a man. He's, he's born in Germany. He comes to East London and he sets up the Workers' Friend Club in, in East London. His name's Rudolf Rocker. Um, and a great name. He's a self-described, I think a self-described anarchist. So uh, we're talking about antinomians. This guy is almost literally self-described an antinomian. He sets up this workers' friend club on Jubilee Street, which is a street in East London, not far from um, Whitechapel Station. And I know it because my grandparents uh, lived there for, for 50 years. So when, when I read, read about Rocker, I was, I was really interested to, to see this. And Rocker is an anarchist and he criticised Marx. He had this critique of Marx. And his critique of Marx was that Marx thought too much about the economic determinants of society. So Marx's theory is uh, culture is economically determined. So you have the economy and different cultural forms spring out of that. And Rocker is in this world, you know, the East End in the, when he's around in the 19th century in Jubilee Street is quite a Marx, a lot of Marxist ideas kicking around there. But he was this anarchist and he flipped that on its head. He said, no, he said, it's the other way around. He said, the economy is culturally determined. So it's culture that comes first and different economic forms spring out of that. And, and, and he says, you know, he says you look at industry and factories they're created by by science it's not the other way around and this is i think a really interesting and quite eye-opening um theory that i want to sort of end with <laughs> because it goes back to what i'm saying about faraday and bull and whether they're individual geniuses or whether the culture enables them and what the balance is there is that it does seem to be something in the water in 19th century britain where people are just are tremendously intellectually curious and that is not solely be dri being driven by they want to be richer or um, they want to improve their social class or they just want to have better status. It does seem to be something that is being driven by a kind of intellectual curiosity about the world. And I think that is something that is present in all cultures and all history and all times, but I think it's present in some areas more than other. And I would argue it's probably present more in... In, in England in, in 1850 than it was in England in 1650 or indeed in 2020. So it's not that I'm saying there's never intellectual curiosity at other times. Obviously there is. Um, it's not that I'm saying the past is always better. It's sometimes, it, you know, the, the, what I always hate about arguments about was the past better is, well, you know, which bit of the past? Like the past is not a monolith. There's a lot of it. <laughs> and so 
as I say, I think 1850 England is different from 1650 England and is different again from 1950 and, and 2020 and what have you. And it does just feel to me that there is something going on with the culture at this time that is producing people and producing ideas and producing these breakthroughs that is quite impressive. And I think this is also interesting because there's a lot of debates going on today about innovation and what w- w- innovation and invention and you have lots of kind of quite high level political debates about our invention and innovation, how are they best developed? So everyone wants the, their country or their, their company or their organisation to be inventive and innovative. And how do we make that happen? And there are these big high level debates about, that t- generally tend to revolve around, well, are inventions best developed by the profit motive or are they best developed by state subsidy? And these fall into quite, I would say, quite routine left or right categories. So you have kind of left wing econ- econ- economists who will point out quite rightly that you know, a lot of big breakthroughs like the Internet, uh, you know, all kinds of things are underpinned by state really quite heavy state subsidy, often into the military. <laughs> uh, things that the private private sector is often just incapable of, of directing that sum of money. And on the flip side of that, you'll have generally right wing economists who will say, OK, so maybe some of the basic research. Yeah, there's some funding from the state. But in the end, it's the profit motive that allows people like Google to come along and monetize this and make it something we can all use. And, you know, GPS, something that's on your phone and someone like Steve Jobs. So they will put the emphasis on the profit motive and, and capitalism in, in turning these inventions into something we can all use. And look, that is a really interesting debate and there's definitely a lot on on either side and you you can see that. But for me, I think there's a really good argument to say that there's a third factor and the third factor is kind of culture. And there's there's this line in in, in management thinking that culture eats strategy for breakfast. (laughs) And I think there is something here about for all of the structures and the institutions and the incentives you have in the end are people getting out of bed in the morning wanting to know more. And if you don't have that, you can have all your incentives in the world. But I'm not sure they're going to gonna help with that. And just to go back to that, getting out of bed in the morning, wanting to know more. Um, I've got, I wanna, I'd like to finish with a lovely quotation from uh, one of the people I talked about right at the beginning, Joseph Keating. And he is this Welsh miner who is, first of all, given the absolute worst job of shoveling out refuse for very little money. He then gets a slightly better job, still in the coal mine, (laughs) and he's able to, when he's not working, he's able to read, he's got access to this library, he also gets a cheap violin and teaches himself music, and here is what he says of this period of his life. He says, reading of all sorts, philosophy, history, politics, poetry and novels was mixed up with my music and other amusements. I was tremendously alive at this period. Everything interested me. Every hour, every minute was crammed with my activities in one direction or another. New mysterious emotions and passions seemed to be breaking out like little flames from all parts of my body. As soon as the morning sunlight touched my bedroom window, I woke. I did not rise. I leapt up. I flung the bedclothes away from me. They seemed to be burning my flesh. A glorious feeling within me as I got out of bed made me sing. My singing was never in tune, but my impulse of joy had to express itself. That's really lovely. That's beautiful. That's right. So if I think if you work in education... (laughs) That's obviously your dream, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but is it a dream any of us realise? Um, so yeah, these people, I'm going to end with, they're very inspiring. So we should maybe meditate on, on what their inspiration has to offer us. One of the threads which came through this episode was the power of new technology to enable autodidacts from the printing press right through to the internet. What we'd like to do in our next episode is to discuss educational innovation. We'll be taking the long view looking at some of the new ideas and technological developments which have been applied to education with mixed success over the ages. We hope you've enjoyed this episode. Tune in next time. You've been listening to Teachers Talk Radio. Tune in live and listen back at ttradio.org. We look forward to hearing from you next time on Teachers Talk Radio.